All right, I think we're going to get rolling if we can go forward to the next slide. Again, today we're going to be talking about personalization as a tool for building a more inclusive workplace. We're so excited to have everyone jumping in today. We have amazing speakers on the line. If we jump forward once more, we'll do a quick introduction of everybody joining us. Um, we'll start with Anju. Um, we'll ask that our speakers share a little bit about where they're working at, what their role is, and what drew them to today's topic. Uh, welcome, Anju. We'll start with you. Thank you so much, Morgan. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. My name's Anju Chaudhary. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm currently head of learning and development at Nextroll. We are a marketing tech company based out of San Francisco. We have offices in Salt Lake City, New York City, Chicago, Dublin, Ireland, and Sydney, Australia. My goals here at Next Role are to create an L&D strategy that supports building lifelong learners at Next Role and mitigating bias in our talent management process. So people find Next Role, our employees find Next Role as an inclusive workplace where they can thrive and we create our equitable opportunity for all our rollers. Now, diversity and inclusion is not a one size fits all. As Morgan mentioned, personalization is the key. So today we're going to be discussing how companies or HR professionals can actually do ditch the check in the box approach and actually create a cultivate a workplace that's so much more inclusive that people provide the best that they can at their workplace. Thank you, Morgan. Hi, everybody. I'll over to Vicki. Oh, hey, thanks, Morgan. <laughs> Um, so I'm Vicky. I do operations at Second Measure. We're a fintech startup based out of the SF Bay Area with offices in San Mateo and New York City. Um, we're about 60 people split primarily between those two locations with a handful of distributed folks. Um, I'm excited to be speaking to you all today about personalization as a method to build inclusivity since I love creating warm, welcome environments and inclusive events. Wonderful. Thank you, Vicky. Um, and again, I'm Morgan. I run our marketing team here at Blueboard. Um, we're based in a few uh, parts of California as well as overseas. And we have a team that's about um, 85 to 100 employees now. So excited for that. We've had a lot of growth this year. Um, you'll also see on the line, um, Mariah, she is our partner in crime over at Sapling. So she and I will be manning the chat as you have questions along the way as well. Um, great, so we're gonna jump into a quick agenda. Um, the first and foremost, we've gotten through our welcome and intros. We'll talk first to set the stage about why personalization is more important now than ever before with all the conditions we're facing in our current uh, state of workplace. And then we'll be handing it over to Anju and Vicky to roll through um, fresh ideas for people programs, um, campaigns they've been running and tools and technology that really help them deliver that element of personalization at scale. Um, Cause personalization is ideal when it can be brought throughout the company um, in an efficient way. We received a lot of great questions from our over 800 registrants that we had for today's event. And we actually have uh, close to 300 of you live on the line. So we're excited to share um, lots of ideas as a community as well. Uh, that means we'll be taking your questions over the chat or Q&A and addressing those um, as we have time at the end. And for those of you who did raise questions during registration, you might see your name in lights. Uh, we've grabbed about five questions that we'll be covering throughout the content today. Um, as you do want to share ideas, we definitely encourage you to um, share that with panelists and attendees. That way you can, again, share your voice with the community, um, or you can also always ask private questions just to our team of panelists. We'll be doing our best to chat with you along the way and grabbing those questions as they come through. A few other housekeeping items just to keep in mind. Um, as a participant, our lines will be muted. We again will be asking for questions either via the chat box or the QA feature, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. And we will be recording this event, which means we'll be sharing that out in just a few days. We'll actually be writing a full recording and recap on our blog that will be getting shared out with everybody who registered. So if you do have to drop early for any reason, um, not to worry, that will be hitting your inbox in, uh, early next week. We can also share a copy of the slides as well if that's something you're interested in. You're welcome to email my team at community at blueboard.com. We'd be happy to share a copy of those with you after the event. And I'll drop a note in the chat about that as well. And for those of you who are seeking um, your SHRM professional development credit, we will be featuring the SHRM code at the end. Feel free to hang out and um, receive that as we wrap up the broadcast today. Perfect, so without further ado, we can jump forward. And we wanted to start by sharing a little bit of context of why we're here today and why this topic is so important for all of us uh, to focus our time on. 
Um, so as we're really familiar, um, our world has absolutely been changing over the last few months. We've had you know, tens of millions of workers in the US be shifted into a remote working environment, whether they wanted to or not, over the last few months. And beyond that, beyond those uh, changing conditions, it's really um, a matter of how have those changing conditions affected our personal needs, uh, desires, responsibilities, and preferences. And that means that instead of a previous approach where HR leaders were focusing really around generational segments as a tool for differentiating employee needs, um, it's much bigger than that now. There's a lot more happening in our lives um, that we need and need to be flexible and differentiated around than before. So as an HR leader, this means that that one size fits all or one size fits most approach will really no longer work um, for the state of our workplace. And as we jump forward, um, that means that brings us to this topic of personalization. So if our needs and our conditions are changing, um, how does that mean um, as an employee that I need to have um, my own needs met differently than before? Um, in our current state, we have a lot of different things going on. We have unique life circumstances. That means that we might have um, kids opening our door, running around in the background. We might be um, caring for um, parents or other family members right now. And there might also just be unique physical conditions that we're not used to. We might not have the right space to accommodate a home office. We might not have the right tools or the fastest internet speed that we were used to or the privacy that we had before. Um, not to mention missed uh, collaboration opportunities. And it comes down to this notion that we're no longer working from home, we're really working with home. We're surrounded by our home and we're also living with work, which is another way we've heard people talk about that recently. So it's a very unique condition that none of us really were prepared for um, and we're kind of navigating that still every day, even though it's been um, a few months now in that current state. Um, and beyond just the physical workspace, the other physical responsibilities we're dealing with, there's also just a lot of um, turmoil in the air. There's a lot of emotional stress related to the global pandemic. Um, there's cultural movements in our backyard. And of course, this notion of return to work um, can create a lot of anxiety and uncertainty for employees. So at the end of the day, now that more than ever, there's this great opportunity. If we jump forward to the next slide, um, as an HR leader to create this more personalized employee experience. And there's two main pillars that we'll think about as tools for creating personalization as a way to deliver on inclusivity in the workforce. The first is all about flexibility. There's actually some great research from Mercer Global Talent Trends. Um, we covered this in a recent ebook that I can post into the chat in just a moment that shares that over 50% of employees uh, wish that their company offered more flexible work options. And beyond that, for working parents, 84% of that group um, ranked flexibility as their number one priority with regards to any type of benefit offering that the company could give them. Flexibility means that we're able to have um, more adaptability to accommodate those responsibilities, those changing conditions that have affected us, and then be able to produce our best work from there. So it means that we need to focus on this notion of supporting work-life integration and giving people the breadth of space to really focus on when they can do their best work and how they can do their best work through flexible benefits. The second opportunity is around power of choice. So giving employees the breath and the visibility to choose experiences that are going to be most meaningful and relevant to their individual needs and goals. So if I'm a working parent, I might need different benefits, a different setup than someone who might be a millennial um, single in their own apartment that might be smaller and not really accommodating a nice workspace. So there's a lot of that going on that we won't be able to read completely just in black and white on their employee profile. It's going to be a lot more of those emotional and physical conditions that we might not be as close to um, as HR leaders. So by offering power of choice, it lets the employee opt in to those opportunities that are going to be most meaningful and relevant to the work that they need to get done. So we'll pause there and I would love to kind of start the conversation with our broader group of speakers now and kick off with asking um, Anju and Vicky just to share a little bit about what personalization means to them when they're thinking about employee experience they're creating at their own companies. Um, Anju, we'll kick it over to you to get started. Thank you, Morgan. That helped set the context right, so appreciate that. As I earlier mentioned, diversity and inclusion isn't one size fits all. We hire diverse candidates so they can provide more innovative ideas. How we make bring them to life is by providing them an opportunity to have a voice at the company. The basic need for all humans is to be seen, heard, and acknowledged. 
And how do we provide those opportunity is basically the personalization that we are talking about today. And this could come in many forms and we'll take some examples as we go through. But for me, as a, a mother of two children, a working parent, um, an immigrant, a person of color, there's so many aspects of my personality than what you can see or when you first meet me. So the intersectionality of our identities actually create the need for personalization. Over to you, Vicky. Thanks, Anju. Um, when we think about our employee experience and personalization, the keyword for us is personal. Um, like Anju and Morgan have said, everyone's needs, wants, intentions, and expectations are unique. So we recognize that sometimes the one size fit all approach really doesn't fit all. Keeping this in mind, we create opportunities for our team to customize their experience, whether it be by choosing how to engage within events or choosing their peripherals. Um, we found that allowing our folks to opt in or out increases our overall employee happiness. So wherever we can, we let them choose their own adventure or level of engagement. Great, and if we jump to the next slide, we have this wonderful visual that Anju's gonna walk through that I thought did a great job of just talking about inclusion and the differences that people might be handling right now. Thank you, yes. I, I think in a visual representation, this is such a powerful visual to actually talk through with people when we talk about what kind of resources and tools do we provide? And as Morgan mentioned a few minutes back, we're working with home and home and work has no boundaries but everybody's situation is very different. And I heard this notion about, oh, we're all, in the, we're all in this together. We actually are, but we're actually in very different stages. For example, imagine everybody being in ocean on a floating device, but some people are actually on a big ship while others on a boat or a yacht, and some people are just hanging on to a floating device. So we might be in a similar situation in a way, but the resources that we have currently or are being provided to us vary very differently. And in that sense, the way we actually produce results or the way we work would differ. So this is a visual that I want you to keep in mind while we're talking about personalization and why there's a need for personalization. Wonderful. So we're going to get started actually with a few questions that had come through the registration uh, just to kind of again continue to ground us in the setup here. So this first question came from Karen and she asked really about, you know, if personalization is so important and I want to take action on that, what are some of the ways that I can start that process? And specifically, are there any tools or techniques for um, discovering those personal preferences from your employees? Um, I wanted to start with Anju because they have an interesting setup here and then Vicki will speak to a little bit about how they like that into onboarding and the culture experience. But yeah, we'll kick it over to you Anju to start. Thank you so much, Morgan. Uh, yeah, so um, I want um, all our listeners to actually sort of picture this in two categories, let's say micro and macro. On a macro level, you're looking at the organization level needs of your uh, employees and then go deeper a little bit into team or geographies. And then on a micro level, look at individuals within a smaller group. And uh, so we do partner with Culture Amp and we do have some surveys that we do. And one of them, which is super powerful is inclusion survey. So every year we partner and customize this survey for our specific needs. However, most of the questions are standard, which means it allows us to actually compare how we fare as compared to the industry standards. Um, that's for organization level. But the actual personalization comes in when we are looking at that data that pours in and dissect it in a way that allows us to view the data that tells us the story of individuals and team members by geographies, by teams, by their identities. So we, we find who are these employees who feel that they have a voice in the company, that they can participate in decision making. And those are the two areas where actually we found that there were some gaps that we'd like to work on. When it comes to individual or personal level, I think the responsibility lies with managers on how they use their one-on-one -on -one meetings with their team members to identify what are the challenges? How can I support you? And then, you know, using tips as simple as when you have a meeting, 
camera on all the time might not be the best for everybody. As Morgan mentioned, you might have children in the background or roommates in the background. There might be a noise, so you might need to stay on mute. And the idea that we want to collaborate and everybody wants needs to speak up all the time is not possible. Try and create different channels. So after a meeting, reach out to the voices you couldn't hear. Ask them if they have something to contribute. Take a 10 second pause. It's as simple as that to maybe bigger steps like the inclusion survey I previously mentioned. I love a, a tip just to pause there on the reaching out to employees one-on-one -on -one who maybe didn't feel comfortable reaching out. Um, it's, it's quite easy, I think, in today's time just to turn the camera off and feel like you can take a back seat or that might be, again, like a point where people need that break and don't want the overstimulation of so many screens and following all the eyeballs and faces as we're used to now doing in the Brady Bunch zone when we have our Zoom on. Um, so I, I really love that idea. I think especially important um, maybe for more junior teammates or others who might not feel comfortable um, really rising to that stage and raising their voice in an environment that is less comfortable um, than maybe an in-person environment would have been. Yeah, Morgan, I just want to add to that. This pause yeah. can be very awkward at first and just get comfortable. Count from one to five very slowly in your head and it's going to get super comfortable just looking at the screen. In personal life, it might not be that uncomfortable, but try for the first two or three meetings. It will become second nature to you and that would allow people to give it a moment and think because not everybody is so open or they haven't digested that information. And if you feel like that happens quite often, try and provide documents early on so people can read through, review, and then come prepared. Yeah, the preparation has been something we've also adopted at Blueboard, just making more conscious effort to do that, um, especially when we have more meetings than usual and um, making sure those meetings are especially effective and also places where decisions can be made versus a place where we're just reviewing things new together. And that also makes people, I think, feel less daunted by the number of meetings if they feel like they're actionable and value driven. Yeah. Great. And thank you so much for that background. And um, Vicki would love to hear on your side too. Thanks, Morgan. I think for, at least for us at Second Measure, um, some tools and techniques that we consider uh, about personalization um, is that we like consider it from the get-go, from the very beginning as early as onboarding and uh, your introductory email. Um, from as part of our HR onboarding, we're getting preferences for things like pronouns, dietary preferences, and even understanding if they're comfortable celebrating their birthday with the wider team. Um, another great, great way to glean this information is to really leverage your people team. Like your people team know your people. Yes, absolutely. And um, we're doing some similar efforts as well, surveying and things like that to get to know employees uh, more comfortably as they start a blue board. So love to hear that you were doing that as well, Vicki, um, especially some of the other um, items around just pronouns and ways that we can be more inclusive and um, kind of taking that step forward to be comfortable and in lockstep with employees to make sure that we're addressing them in the way that they want to be seen and heard. So on that note, um, where do we kind of cross a line? If we jump to the next slide, um, I love this question from Ken. Um, personalization is so important. We obviously want to learn as much as we can about our teams to make sure that we're delivering their most optimal experience. But is there a point where it becomes too much and how do you ultimately make employees feel comfortable um, when you are asking for more personal information from them? So Anju, um, I wanted to start with you. Um, I know you have a, some thoughts on this first question. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Yes, actually, this, this actually got me thinking because, um, first of all, Ken, thank you for this question. In the need to do something for our employees, we jump on what is coming up as suggestion most of the time without realizing what are, how are we going to handle the data. So we discussed about inclusion survey or multiple survey that our company is doing. The need is to understand our employees better so we can provide them the best resources. However, explain early on what is the survey going to serve the purpose? How is the data going to be collected? Who has the view of the data? Is the, the survey anonymous or attributed? Once the data comes back, how is it going to be handled? And the story that the data tells, how will you share this with the broader organization? 
eventually what actions will come out of this and keep them informed about it. I think there are multiple things that you need to work on before jumping onto a solution of identifying the data. I want to share the example of women in workplace study that Next Rule participates for last few years now. And the latest one that we came out with, one option for us was to share out the deck and say, here's the study that happened, here's the context, and this is how Next Rule's actually surveyed against other companies in tech. Uh, but we actually chose a different route. We created a very diverse panel of individuals who shared their insights or their portions of the insights from that study with our organization. And they actually added their personal experiences at Next Role that were relevant to the women in workplace study. So I thought that was very powerful. People did, this did resonate really well with most of our employees and they loved the idea of having our leaders and cross people from cross-functional identities share this study. Yeah, I think the main takeaway for me just hearing you speak was, you know, the intention of what you're going to be doing with the data and then understanding the right format based on how you're going to be collecting the data. So is it anonymized? Is it something that you might be able to pull out some of those specific stories and get permission to share um, as you do that? And then making sure that um, we're also not getting survey fatigue. So um, sometimes there's a lot of pulse surveys or biannual or quarterly engagement surveys that get sent out right to employees and making sure that they feel excited um, to take those surveys and to share more information and that there will be action taken after those insights are gathered as well. Wonderful. All right, um, we can continue to power forward and we'll be actually moving now into the fun stuff. So this is all about the real people programs that Anju and Vicky have created that will help us create personalization at scale. We're going to start with Anju, who's going to walk through a few programs for us. Uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you. So uh, first of all, with pandemic as most of the companies are doing, we all are remote workers. We are at remote swill, as I heard from another webinar a few days back, and um, not everybody's comfortable. Also, the pandemic led to consequences that were financial in nature, which means that we don't have the budgets as we used to, and that got us thinking and trying to create more innovative uh, solutions in L&D space and one of them was the Leader Speak series or the SME support that I, I actually uh, found within Next Role. Instead of doing leadership programs with third-party vendors, we actually reached out to our leaders and asked them, would you be able to speak on these topics? And then we actually created a resource library for them for to pull up the content and work with them to be able to deliver these workshops. And this is phenomenal. We got great response from our employees. One, our leaders come from an experience. Two, they relate to our culture and values. And three, they can actually customize the content that resonates with our company. And that's when we actually realized these have been very powerful and we'd continue using them in future as well. We also moved away from classroom and try to provide learning opportunities at, let's say, a lot more lunch and learn sessions, more fireside chats instead of a classroom session. The fatigue, I mean, there's absolutely no way we can expect people to be with a screen for a four hour training session. So we try and divide those sessions into multiple batches and allow people a flexibility to join the non mandatory versus mandatory training as it comes. The um, idea that we can use nudges and micro learning helped a continuum of learning for all our um, employees at Next Role because then it keeps the learning fresh and when we send out nudges on a weekly basis on the topics they have done training. So these are some of the ways we have personalized to help them with their personal and professional development. Something I love about these two and um, something similar that we've been adopting at Blueboard as we haven't had as many in-person team events, we're leaning into more virtual programming. Um, we've seen so many um, wonderful thought leaders and people who are passionate about topics. Maybe it's around diversity and inclusion or around even online fitness training um, and offering virtual yoga classes and things like that. It's been a really awesome opportunity for people who might not normally be in a leadership position to rise to that challenge and to work through those skill sets and to carve out a little bit more of their own identity and brand uh, within the company as well. So I love that you guys are doing that and really opening that up to the various subject matter experts as well as learning from leaders. Since those um, are maybe also entities that are not always accessible, um, they're able to form new relationships with a broader swath of employees as well. 
Wonderful. Yeah, we can jump on to the next one. Great. Yeah, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add was when we bring the diverse talent at a company, we want them to perform the best which means they need to be comfortable sharing their ideas. And that's the reason we always advocate for diverse employees, because then they bring different perspectives to solutions. And you're more than okay to continue having homogenous workforce if you're trying to solve for problems which are small scale or which are repetitive. So let's say in industrial work, sometimes it's okay. But we're trying, we're in a tech space, which means we are trying to solve problems which are for future for larger communities and these are problems that we've never anticipated in the past which means there is a need for brilliant ideas that come from all different perspectives now once these employees come to your organization that diversity checkbox is done but how do they feel they belong here and they're actually okay that they can speak up their ideas and for that reason we do have a lot of employee resource groups and i want to mention specifically about role deep during the turbulent times and uh, when one, there's pandemic and two, there has been emotional unrest because of the deaths of so many African-American, uh, sorry, this is so difficult. Uh, there's so many deaths and pol police brutality that is happening around. And during this time we needed our employees to feel safe and we wanted them, we wanted to create a safe space for them to speak up and give them a space for connecting with each other just providing that framework for the organization where we have a common language to support them and just reaching out and saying hey i'm here for you wasn't really very helpful so roll deep our employee resource group does exactly that they find the allies and the um, and the black employees actually participate in a role deep group and they educated larger organization. They provided that space. They actually hired consultants who could come and provide us the framework that we're going to speak in next slide. Thank you. Sorry, this was a little difficult for me to talk through. No, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. It's a very touchy subject. It's affecting a lot of us in very unique ways. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Uh, this is the framework that I actually mentioned few seconds back, we um, hired a consultant who actually helped us look at it in a way that provided you a framework and language. The most difficult part to contribute for even allies, active allies is how do I talk or what can I say? How can I help? Now to answer those questions, look at the framework. The, the green zone is the comfort zone, the place where we mostly hang out. Uh, our friends, our colleagues that we're familiar with, and this is the area which, which we all are comfortable in. And it will differ for each person on how big or how different is their comfort zone. The learning zone is where we want our allies and employees to explore a little further. And this is the constructive discomfort zone. The red zone is the danger zone. We don't want employees to go further down in the danger zone. That can be very, uh, that would detriment their efforts. They might not feel comfortable talking about the issues that are in red zone. So the best way to deal with this is grow the learning edges further down and that will actually eliminate the danger zone. Uh, we got this framework. We're very happy with this because a lot of employees have been quoting this while they're having conversations around inclusion. And um, I would like to actually um, ask Morgan how it resonates with you. Absolutely. Um, I agree that we're all at a place where we're um, really finding this craving. It's, it's at least been at least popular at Blueboard. I'd be really curious on the chat if anyone has also felt this with your employees. But we're finding that our team and our community of Blueboarders are really leaning into this opportunity to develop skills and new areas of growing themselves. Um, because there might be some departments that are a little bit less busy or um, we're all kind of pivoting and changing very rapidly, right, as we're, as we're responding to the pandemic. So there's a lot of appetite for learning right now and it's really important to position opportunities. Um, maybe that's through OKRs, through special projects. Um, my team has also offered some kind of 10% projects, if you will, for employees to lean into new skill development, specifically in social media. 
um, to really let them have that opportunity to learn and challenge themselves. But what I loved about the framework was the language and the shared opportunity for people to feel comfortable to raise a flag if they are approaching that danger zone. Um, and the danger zone, again, might be, you know, I don't feel set up for success to have this conversation. I'm not educated enough. That might play into more of a diversity and inclusion environment. Um, or maybe I don't feel like I have the skills. I'm not ready yet to take on this challenge. I need a little bit more support. Um, so I love that it, um, it breeds vulnerability, but it also encourages people to lean forward and challenge those comfort zones in a way to learn and level up and really prepare themselves maybe for a new career or an internal move or something that might bring them um, more motivation and happiness like as they continue with your company. So yeah, I love this framework. And I think again, like the shared language is so critical too and loved that you said that it's bubbling up into some of those performance conversations as well. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm at, this, is, this is the power of this, uh, like you rightly said, being able to say, hey, this is the danger zone. I don't feel comfortable. Yeah about it that's about it you don't have to explain yourself further which is the power of having a common shared language and framework yeah and we did have a question come through from sarah she was just asking um if you could recall where it was adapted from if there was maybe a speaker name or an institution that had rolled this out if um, people are interested to learn more i believe this is from university of michigan idg which is interracial design group well for us th this is adapted framework which was shared by inclusion design group which is led mm -hmm. by uh derica blackmon and uh, she's the consultant who came over and shared this framework thank you okay yeah i will look that up as we jump to the next slide and drop a link in for everyone um and yeah just reading through some of the other notes as well um i was reading through a question from grace that just came through if we don't mind taking a pause we have some a lot of audience questions coming through and mostly everybody's very appreciative Anju for your compassion and just for all the detail that this slide is sharing. So thank you again for all of the great detail. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, when we were thinking about resources and again, like, you know, giving employees this opportunity to lean forward and learn, um, Grace's question is around the vein of how do we make sure that we don't um, overwhelm, you know, employees with opportunities to where they might just say like, I'm out, I don't want to take this opportunity. Um, they might be approaching that danger zone. So is there a way that you might, as a manager or as a people leader, um, facilitate ways to learn more about where employees are at with that? I'm approaching my danger zone or understanding maybe how to give them um, enough or too many resources. Like how do you kind of think about the line and preventing, um, you know, the danger zone from happening if possible? <laughs> yeah, uh, on a broader level, uh, let me tell you, most of the underrepresented minorities are always hanging out on danger zone, not on purpose. They're actually being pushed out on that. So just remember that. Do not mm -hmm. overburden underrepresented minorities. The burden to educate is not on them. It's on us or anybody who wants to learn more about it. So that's number one. Number two, opt in and opt out. We completely understand people are at different stages of their learning journey with any topic. And so is the diversity and inclusion. Sometime, you know, I, I feel aha when I'm like, wow, I felt this was so basic and the other person would know about it, but it's not, you know, that that's when I'm coming from my biases. So we all have biases. If you have a brain, you have a bias, but unconscious bias training and you're done is not enough. So that's number one. You're still hanging out on your comfort zone. If you're saying we did an unconscious bias training, then we're good to go. That's, that's not enough. There has to be more action towards it. And the responsibility of the action now, unfortunately or fortunately lies with the managers who are first touch point. So the personalization piece again would be getting to know your team members on a personal level. What do they go through? What are their challenges? What are their needs for motivation? How can you support them? And it's okay to ask questions, it's fine, but do give them the space to say no and let, let the manager know that I don't feel comfortable talking about this. So I guess all, all these are things would matter, but overall in a company or a team, have some, some sort of a framework on how the team meetings will happen. Have some sort of a framework on how ideas is being shared because let's say for example, in this group, 
well, we're quite homogenous, but if there was a person who didn't feel comfortable, then we advocate for them and say, haven't heard from, let's say, Vicky for some time, and I'd like to share this. So be each other's support system and provide that space. If the manager is not equipped to do that, it's okay and tell them that as a team, we feel the need to have that support. But the responsibility does not lie with underrepresented minorities at all. That's the most critical piece that we need to mention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, um, Vicky would actually, I was going to ask you as well, like if this framework landed with you in a certain way, if there's anything that you're similarly thinking about um, for the team at Second Measure. For, on my side, for the team at Second Measure, we're always trying to figure out a way to foster this learning's edge or additional learning and create a safe environment uh, for people to observe and participate. Um, I think for us, it's always important to know that every person is different and what might work for an extrovert in a large group setting doesn't translate well to someone who is more introverted and needs like the smaller one on one time. Um, and so when we craft our events and activities, we always try to cater to both capturing like opportunities for these extroverts to excel and also the introverts to feel heard and seen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that we're thinking about not just like maybe a demographic representation, but also that um, we're kind of personal, like if you're introverted, extroverted, all of those factors are making that new personal ID that employees are bringing to work. So it's important, again, to keep all this top of mind. And Andrew, I love that, you know, it's not the employee's responsibility, especially for underrepresented. It's really the manager or that leader's responsibility to create a space that's welcoming and safe for everybody to participate. Wonderful. Um, we can jump into the next slide, I believe. Great. This is my favorite slide. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, we call our employees as rollers. We're next role a marketing tech company. So most of our acronyms go by role. So role anniversary is actually anniversary. And um, I have joined uh, last year. It's going to be one year pretty soon at Next Role, which I'm super excited about. And I heard my colleagues talking about Blueboard experiences. And I was super curious to know. And that's when I connected with Morgan, actually. Um, so during our uh, role anniversary or anniversary milestone, our rollers actually get these customized experiences that they choose, these personalized ex experiences from array of options, first of all. There are so many options. So it's not a mug, a t-shirt, or things like that, which is just, you know, uh, we, we usually provide. But these experiences are uh, phenomenal. I want to share the example of my colleague from a People Team. She actually took her kids to a museum as a family outing, and this was phenomenal. First of all, the museum tickets were pretty expensive. Number two, they were not easy to find all the time. You couldn't make arrangements all the time. So she was really thankful. And this is a memory that her children actually spoke about over and over. So I wanna mention this has been, this partnership has been amazing. I do look forward to my anniversary to get my personalized gift, but these are the ways we continue motivating our employees. We tell them that we value your contribution at the company and at the moments that matter, which is anniversaries, birthdays, et cetera, having these experiences create more loyalty and employees want to continue doing uh, their best every day when they work for a company that looks after them. Thanks so much, Anju, for sharing that. And um, yeah, just to reiterate, we love that with Blueboard, it's the power of choice. So it's not, you know, the same reward given to everybody on their anniversary in this case. It's the employee gets to choose a reward that's most meaningful to them. And especially um, while we're sheltered in place in many areas still, it's opportunities to maybe do something from the comfort of your home. So maybe learning um, how to do photography and receiving a DSLR camera that you get to play with and enjoy um, or learning to play the guitar or taking um, virtual fitness classes all the way through um, building like a DIY garden in your backyard with a greenhouse, which has been incredibly popular, especially in the summer months. Um, but there's also a lot of adventures that employees can look forward to as they're comfortable. So that would be more of that and about the museum experiences, as you mentioned. Um, in this case, someone who got to fly a plane over the peninsula um, for the first time for her anniversary. So lots of opportunities and it's all about the employee choosing what's most meaningful for them. So I appreciate you sharing that and of course your employees, your coworker story as well. 
All right, um, and if we power forward, we've got one more, I believe, from Anju, and then we'll pass it over to Vicky. Thank you so much. This is really close to my heart. This is a project that we start, I started working with my other colleague, which is uh, about eliminating bias from performance management. Now, I truly support the performance management system actually allow us to set goals and then work towards them to ensure that we're reaching our objectives in the best way possible. To be able to do that effectively, the, uh, the job basically is with the employee and their managers, right? But when we're doing the performance management reviews, most of the time they're cookie cutter approach. The language that is being used sometimes is coming from place of bias. Now, the project that we're working on for performance management, eliminating bias, we're actually providing tools to our, our managers uh, and not all companies do have, let's say, resources. And I completely understand some of the companies have tech resources that are uh, built in into the performance management tool. For example, we use Reflective as a way to set goals, to have one-on-one -on -one coaching with the managers, to be able to create reviews within the tool. So it's pretty comfortable. But in the absence of that, I highly recommend the, the charge with people business partners or HR business partners to work with the managers and ask them to take a pause and take a step back and say, is this review really coming from personality or identities of these people or the review really beneficial in a way that the person can actually take an action to improve and do better work? And I want to take an example. For example, for women reviews, most of the time research says being bossy, aggressive and things language like that is being used however when it comes to men the language like passion and leadership is being used in similar scenarios uh, so somebody says you're too aggressive what does that even mean i'm aggressive towards reaching my goals or aggressive towards team i don't even know what to do with this so you're actually making a comment about somebody's personality or perceived personality instead of giving them something to really work about so be careful, be mindful of the way the goals are being set, that they align really well with the team goals and company goals. During the one-on-one -on -one meetings, use those opportunities as coaching moments and help employees understand how they're performing and how can you help eliminate barriers for their success. And number three, when the time comes for reviews, do look at the language, the way it is formed, that it provides actionable outputs to employees to to just improve and get better as time goes. Uh, so be careful of bias in performance management because we do pay so much attention to bringing diverse workforce, but for them to thrive at an organization and continue getting these opportunities that they get excited about, it's important that performance management is done right. Great, there were a few questions coming through just really quickly um, on that on you. I'm just curious about any partners or groups you've worked with to help lead um, unconscious bias training. Is that something you're typically developing in house or are you looking towards external partners to help you create that content? Absolutely, I'm happy to talk through this. Our unconscious bias training is actually developed in house, but we, we have unconscious bias training, we have ally skills training, we have inclusive leadership training. Those were the things that we've done in the past, but we felt the need to do so much more. So uh, working on biases, finding out biases in the entire talent management process is in-house project. But I do want to recommend um, Culture Amp has been partners with us to uh, work on inclusion programs for us right now, our employee resource group, our diversity and inclusion committee members, our leadership team, HR business partner, and less of the people team. These are the resources that we tap onto. Um, there are free resources. Life Labs has a, a guide that they share or sort of a framework for the I, which is free for all. And if you do not have resources to buy out or work with consultant, I recommend start there first. Um, the other thing that I really wanna mention is Ally skills program is pretty effective. Uh, there's a free version somewhere on, on net. We can share this afterwards, which was started by Valerie Aurora. We've customized that and that's the one that we're using. Uh, you can, you can, you know, it's free resource. 
she's pretty open to the idea of using uh, for other companies to use it and customize for their needs. What's really important is at some point do engage with consultants. These are very sensitive topics. We will come from our understanding as HR professionals. We feel that we, we are equipped to talk to these topics, but not really. We do need consultants and engage with underrepresented minorities, please, if you're giving your business. Uh, there are so many of uh, the folks into the business. I'm more than happy to share resources after, after this. Okay, we added the Life Labs DEI playbook. Thank you. Yeah, right. Andrew, could you just repeat um, some of the top resources you mentioned? There's a few questions coming through. We, we posted the Life Labs for you, but I think there was one or two others that you mentioned. So Valerie Aurora's Ally Skills Workshop, and I'll find the link yeah. somewhere. Correct. Yes. There you go. Thanks, yeah, Grace. Grace actually just posted it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. And I'd recommend uh, do work with consultants so that you can give your company's values and cultures. And, and the, be, be careful about readiness level. For example, Vicky mentioned earlier that not everybody is comfortable jumping into the, the learning zone just yet. They might look at learning zone as danger zone. So get help, use as many resources and support groups that you can provide. Uh, yes, I guess we'll share the resources afterwards. Yeah, we can actually plan to link to a lot of these in our recap. So we'll plan to do that on our end. Right. And uh, make don't make the trainings one-off opportunity that happen and goes away because that's not going to help many people. First of all, these topics are very complicated. To, they need to be practiced consistently for a sustainable change within the organization. Do not treat diversity and inclusion as a separate initiative, it needs to be integrated within everything that is being done, which includes if you're hosting meetings and town halls, how are they being ho hosted? If you're having conversations around performance management, who are the voices that control that conversation? When you're having promotions and their strategic projects, who's making decisions into those areas? So uh, it's okay to ask hard questions, difficult questions, uh, do partner with your leadership team and coach them when it needs to be. Okay, let me see if there are more questions. All right, I'm happy to uh, connect with folks and um, help this conversation, but over to you, Morgan. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna shift gears and pass it over to Vicki. She's got a few examples to share as well. So we'll pass it over to you. And Thanks thank you again, Anju, for all the great insights so far. Thank you. Um, so as second measure, when it comes to company-wide events, we've learned that uh, having the team choose from a short list of pre-selected activities was a hit. Um, our first time using the choose your own adventure model, uh, we offered woodworking, coffee class, and then a ramen noodle making class. Um, these events would happen concurrently after which we reconvened for the larger team social time, so drink snibbles and fun. Um, so one of the fun things and great communication building things about your choose your own adventure model is the connection building that you can have prior to the event. It's an easy introductory talking point for folks for, from different teams um, who may not interact with each other normally. Um, the passing, what activity are you going to choose is a great conversation starter. Um, what, when we select the activities, um, it's really custom to your team. So this is the part where you can leverage, leverage the, your knowledge and personalized activities more specifically for your team. Um, I knew my team loved coffee, food and cooking, arts and crafts, so it maybe uh, needed a bit more guidance. Um, knowing this, I knew that the teacher student experience would be a great fit for, for most people. Um, the models really worked for us as we've grown and can be applied to a variety of parameters. Say, for example, at our like winter offsite, we pre-selected for varying levels of uh, physical exertion. So offering a ski lesson, curling activities, or like a spa time. So we let people decide how into the winter stuff they wanted to be. Um, a different take on the same idea is to provide activities for different engagement levels. Um, so we had the high activity, high engagement participation of dragon boat racing. Um, we had, and then we had the adjacent participation or spectator type view, um, which is picnicking alongside the boaters. And then the middle ground of riding in an electric boat on the same waters. It's like a shared experience with different perspectives. Um, but what does choice-based 
team events look like during this COVID time. Um, the circumstances have changed and we're not likely to be gathering in large groups anytime soon. And so it's changed the process. It's influenced how we schedule our all hands and the various culture-based activities like trivia. Um, we learn to schedule these company-wide activities or meetings at times that work best for most time zones. So we have folks on both coasts and the UK and Germany, and then recording and sharing for those who weren't able to attend. Um, for these culture-based activities, calling out the great, if you can make it, cool if you can, knowing that like our employees might have other matters or conflicting client calls. Um, but the, the key thing through all the, throughout this time is to like lead with empathy. Like everyone's got a lot of things going on at home. Managing expectations about attendance or timing is really helpful and advance notice is really great too for scheduling childcare and internet bandwidth. Um, so we're still figuring out what this looks like and that's okay. We're in an ever changing environment and like while, and we'll lean into our core values, which is to be human. Um, so how do you apply this choice based process to a return to work plan and this remote working? Um, we know that the new normal workplace will look really different um, and with the spiking cases nationwide could be well into the future. Um, we understand this and so communicating when you can, where you can really helps the team figure out their future plans. Um, caveating stuff with things might change based on the developments of the coronavirus environment like kind of built in. Um, it's really hard to plan for what you don't know. Um, we're effectively leaning into our core values and figuring it out and being real. Um, and then as it pertains to everyone's work from home experience, like we know that everyone's work from home setup is different and that disparity influences productivity. Um, so we offer up loaner equipment if they need it, say a borrowed desk, chair, um, loaned out monitors, laptop riser, and sending out their peripherals. One of the things we didn't know was how work from home was really going for them. And so we asked, um, we surveyed the team to get a sense of their current state and any other needs that we can help address. We're still defining like what we can do with this information, but we're leaning into our core values to guide our decision. Can you actually, um, I loved the core value that you mentioned when we had our call yesterday, Vicki, can you give a little bit more color around the one that you're mentioning about being human and what that really looks like? Um, it yeah. seems like it's driven a lot of the decisions you've made about making choice such a priority at the company. Yeah, so our being human value is around exercising a lot of empathy. Like everyone is their own individual with their unique uh, experiences and needs. Um, and so giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. Um, they're trying to do their best and it's our job to ensure that and support them while they figure stuff out for themselves too. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's all about um, kind of going back to earlier conversations, continuing to have places where employees can raise a hand, mm -hmm. uh, feel comfortable reaching out. And then to your point, um, making a lot of kind of, you know, different opportunities for people to take advantage of those resources. I thought the loaner equipment one was really interesting, making sure people feel like they can have a contactless pickup or whatever it might be, right, to get those pieces of equipment and continuing you know, to explore ways to make people feel productive. Um, Andrew, I wanted to um, open it up to you as well, just to speak to how Nextrol is considering um, return to work and anything that you guys are rolling out already. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Morgan. Yes, uh, so we, we formed a return to work task force or return to office. We're all working still. So return to office task force. The idea was to uh, actually work with our employees and first, find out what they feel like, and then try and relate this with CDC guidelines, government guidelines. And since we work from different geographies, it's important to consider uh, those criteria as well. We were about to open our Sydney office, and then unfortunately, we, we plan to take a pause on that decision for now. And um, in, in spite of that, what we actually found in the survey was uh, most people, especially parents of young children, felt that they couldn't be back to work for to office just yet. So we said, okay, how can we support this time while you're working at home and ergonomic 
do, would you need resources like ergonomic chairs? Can we do some trainings in, in the way that you understand what's the right posture? How, what exercises can you do? Some sort of meditation, yoga, those mindfulness programs that we do at Workflows are continuing. We actually have a specific uh, uh, program called Roll Well that delivers these programs. So uh, though our res results for return to office task force concluded that it doesn't look like we're going to workforce anytime soon, there's no hurry for us to get back to office. We don't want to be the first in that race, but we want to support our employees while they're working at home in any way possible. We've uh, started giving a stipend to our employees. Uh, and I understand that might not be a solution for everybody, but for now, uh, those are some of the things that we're doing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this hour has completely flown by. <laughs> We're actually going to jump ahead a few slides and hopefully get back to one of these questions, but I wanted to let our sponsors do a quick introduction. I'm going to kick it over to Mariah to give a quick overview of Sapling. And in the background, we're going to run a poll. Um, this is a really great opportunity. If you um, are excited to learn more about Sapling or would like to learn more about Blueboard, you can just click yes on screen. And that means our team will uh, reach out to you directly after the event. Um, Mariah, feel free to give us a little bit of an overview about Sapling. Hey everyone, Mariah from the Sapling team here. Morgan, thank you so much. And Vicki and Anju, oh my gosh, I like, can't take notes fast enough today. You guys are amazing, so thank you for this. Um, quick overview of Sapling and, and our role really in the inclusion um, and customization space. We are an onboarding and core HR platform optimized specifically for remote teams and giving visibility to HR of what's going on in your organization. While we are a central source of truth for your global employee data, um, our goal is to integrate really with every key tool across your HR tech stack, really taking that best of breed approach and allowing you to pick and choose those, those tools that are gonna engage with your workforce um, and provide a unique experience and just roll them all into the same HR platform. Awesome. Some of our biggest customers would be Warby Parker, um, Envision, Webflow. We work with a lot of SMBs as well. Um, so if you guys have any questions around customizing, specifically around the onboarding or offboarding experience, we'd love to chat. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And just a quick reminder about Blueboard, if we jump to the next slide, um, we're all about experiences to celebrate all of life's moments, whether that's, um, you know, really living company values and developing a spot recognition program, celebrating tenured um, employees for anniversaries. And it's all about that power of choice. So choosing rewards that are most meaningful to you. Again, rewards for today that might be, you know, fitness at home, investing in a Peloton that you might not otherwise have bought for yourself, uh, learning to play the guitar, or looking forward to those out and about adventures, um, maybe doing some hiking and exploring national parks, um, going to a spa and getting some much needed R&R &R that I'm sure all of us could need right now. Um, employees get to choose their favorite and they get to work with our amazing concierge team who treats them like royalty and takes care of all the planning and logistics to make their experience really special and personalized. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we're going to jump to um, the end slide just so we can reveal the SHRM code. And as we wrap up on that slide, I'm going to have um, the panelists just share um, what's kind of the main takeaway that you would love to have the audience walk away with. I know we covered a lot, so it might be tricky, but um, Anju, we'll start with you. Um, what would you like everyone to leave with today, if anything? Sure. If you're not intentionally including, then you're unintentionally excluding, and that intention leads to personalizing their experiences. Wonderful, Vicki, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so one of my favorite takeaways is just making sure and helping people feel empowered. And one way of doing that is allowing them to exercise choice. Um, folks like to have control over what they can. And so giving them an easy opportunity to do so is um, very helpful for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I especially learned a lot just around the learning zone, comfort zone, danger zone. I'm excited to share some of those learnings with our team. So I appreciate, oh my gosh, I think Mariah just sent a ton of notes through. So, oh, Anju did as well. <laughs> Amazing. So um, she's been taking copious notes. Um, love all of those tips that are shared. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I'll be sharing those kind of uh, danger zone, comfort zone as well with the team. And I think there's a lot to um, look forward to bringing that into our own culture at Blueboard. Um, there's a lot of resources on screen um, as well as the SHRM PDC code. Again, that's 2052YTM. 
um, as well as some resources for getting in touch with our sponsors. We'll actually be hosting another webinar in two weeks with Amplify that will be in a continued vein of guiding employees towards um, meaning and purpose during these turbulent times. So how can you motivate and um, make people feel seen and valued? And um, we're excited for that webinar coming up in two weeks. Um, you can also continue to send um, recognition notes with Lift Up. And Sapling also has a huge suite of resources on their blog, um, webinar recordings, ebooks to download, as well as um, specifically solutions that they've designed to support distributed teams. So making sure that as we continue down this remote work journey that employees feel supported and included, um, please check that out at saplinghr.com. If we go up one slide, Mariah, we'd love to end uh, just with a question out to the audience, which would be, you know, what's one thing that you can do today to help your company be more personalized or inclusive? Um, I hope that this content was meaningful and helpful for you. I wanted to give a huge thank you to Vicki, to Anju, and to Mariah, my partner in crime, for bringing this all together. And thanks to the over 300 people that joined us today to be part of this conversation. Have an amazing rest of your day, and we will see you soon um, on our next webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you so Thanks much, everybody. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks, Mariah. Thanks, everyone.